What comes to mind when you hear the words Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France? We're guessing it's a certain petit corporal in a bicorn hat rearing up majestically on a horse as he conquers half of Europe. But what if we told you there was another Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, a Bonaparte who not only managed to rule France for longer than his famous predecessor, but basically created modern Paris? Well, today you're going to meet that man, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, aka Napoleon III. He was the actual nephew of Napoleon. As a child, he was forced to watch the French Empire collapse and see his family driven into hiding. As an adult, he single handedly returned the empire from ruin and then ruled it for 22 years. He's the man who created modern Paris, the politician who made France great again, and the general who led his nation into a ruinous war. Napoleon III, he was certainly all of these things and many more. And in the video today, the story of history's forgotten Bonaparte. On March the 20th, 1811, cannons boomed out across Paris. Revelers gathered outside the Tuileries' Paris. It was official. Emperor Napoleon had a son. Had he been old enough to understand the news, three-year-old Charles-Louis Napoleon Bonaparte may have felt sadness. Born on April the 20th, 1808, the boy was the younger son of Louis Bonaparte, brother of the Emperor and Queen Hortense of Holland, who, just to gross you out a little, was also Louis Bonaparte's niece. More important than his parents' creepy relationship, though, was that Louis Napoleon was a potential heir to the imperial crown, along with his older brother, Napoleon Louis. And no, I didn't screw that up. Louis Napoleon, star of our story, had an older brother called Napoleon Louis. Apparently, they thought there just weren't enough French guys running around with the name Napoleon. <laughs> it's pretty good. Or maybe we should just say that he had been an heir. Prior to that March day in 1811, Emperor Napoleon, he had no legitimate son to inherit the crown. Now, though, he no longer had any need for his nephews. This was tragic, not just from the perspective of Louis Napoleon not being emperor, but also because producing new Bonapartes was the only reason his parents were married. Louis and Hortense, they totally hated one another. By 1810, they couldn't even live in the same country. Hortense had taken the boys to Paris, while Louis remained in Holland. Not that young Louis Napoleon saw much of his famous uncle in the French capital. No longer a likely heir, he spent the early 1810s simply hanging around, waiting for his newborn cousin to supplant him as the future emperor. And for that to happen, he did not have to wait very long. In 1812, Emperor Napoleon made the really stupid mistake of invading Russia. Barely 18 months later, the French Empire it was in ruins, and Paris was under Allied occupation. Realizing that the jig was up and desperate to save his dynasty, Napoleon abdicated and made his three-year-old son Emperor Napoleon II on April the 4th. 1814. But it was at this point that the occupying allies were pretty much like, that's not happening, and forced the entire Bonaparte line to abdicate two days later on April the 6th before handing young Napoleon II over to Austria. If you started this video thinking Napoleon III, what about Napoleon II? Where did he go? Well, he went to Austria. That's why there's not really a video about him. In the aftermath of Waterloo, the entire Bonaparte clan it was forced into exile. Louis Napoleon and his family they resettled in Switzerland, where they could do nothing but watch as France abolished its empire and restored the monarchy. It could have been a crushing psychological blow if it were not for Queen Hortense. From the moment they reached exile, Hortense started grooming Louis Napoleon and his brother to become future emperors. Now, this was an absurd thing to do, but it would also turn out to totally be the right move. On May 5, 1821, Napoleon Bonaparte died in exile on St. Helena. Back in Europe, the news made all the great powers suddenly super nervous about young Napoleon II. So worried were they about this child prisoner taking his father's mantle that they completely overlooked Louis Napoleon. No one noticed as he and his brother moved to Italy's Papal States in 1826. No one noticed as they joined the Carbonari Lodge and started training in revolutionary warfare. Like an audience watching a magic trick, Europe's great powers were too busy looking at the wrong Napoleon. By the time they realized their mistake, it was too late. On July the 22nd, 1832, Napoleon II caught pneumonia in Austria, and he died at age 21. When the news hit, all surviving members of the Bonaparte line were quick to renounce their claims to the imperial crown. That was with one exception. The year before, in 1831, Louis Napoleon's older brother, Napoleon Louis, had been carried off by an outbreak of measles. That meant that the chance to become Napoleon III it passed straight to Louis Napoleon. His mother's prediction had come absolutely true, and he was the heir to the French Empire.
So here's the thing about suddenly declaring yourself Emperor of France. It doesn't actually make you Emperor of France. Trust me, I've tried. That is not to say that Louis Napoleon's claim, unlike mine, was not totally empty. There was still a large contingency of Bonapartists in France looking to revive the empire. France itself it was also unstable. In July 1830, the three glorious days had toppled the restored Bourbons and put the July monarchy on the throne, while June 1832 had seen another attempted revolution against the July monarchy, this time involving a lot more show tunes. No, 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 no. It wasn't hard to imagine, therefore, some charismatic leader with the Bonaparte name rallying the people of France to his side and overthrowing the government. Sadly, though, Louis Napoleon was not that man. You see, Napoleon III, he was a weird-looking guy. A member of his entourage once described him as a small man with a long, fat face, broad, drooping shoulders, a fat torso, and very short legs. He walked slowly with his feet pointing out and his body tilted to the left side. He was also puffed up, he was pompous, he was prone to prancing around in military regalia. Although he was said to be charming in private, Europe at large regarded Louis Napoleon as something of a clown. And the thing is here, he kind of was a clown. Take the Strasbourg coup as an example. On October the 3rd, 1836, Louis Napoleon tried to seize control of France by walking into a military garrison in Strasbourg and rallying the men to his cause. Instead, the garrison commander had all of the mutineers arrested and Louis Napoleon was deported to America. Not that the exile lasted very long, though. In August of 1837, Queen Hortense fell seriously ill. Louis Napoleon caught the first boat back to Europe to be at her side when she passed away on October the 5th. Rather than return to America, America, in the wake of his mother's death, Louis Napoleon instead went to London. It was while in the British capital that he cooked up boneheaded coup attempt numero due. By 1840, the July monarchy it was unpopular. Looking to prop up his support, King Louis Philippe arranged to have Napoleon Bonaparte's remains reinterred in Paris's Les Invalides. Across the Channel, Louis Napoleon mistook the celebrations for a sign that the French were crying out for another Emperor Bonaparte. So on August 5, 1840, he rounded up a gang of 56 mercenaries and staged a landing at Boulogne-sur-Mer. The plan was that the sight of Louis Bonaparte would inspire the population of France to revolt and overthrow the July monarchy, and then hoist Louis Napoleon up onto their shoulders and declare him Emperor of the French. Instead, the Emperor was once again promptly arrested. The coup of 1840 was so flagrantly incompetent that it probably saved Louis Napoleon's life. Le Journal de Debats wrote, One doesn't kill crazy people, one just locks them up. The July monarchy, well, they agreed. Rather than death, Louis Napoleon was condemned to life imprisonment in Harm Fortress near Reims. Despite his insurrectionary past, Louis Napoleon's imprisonment it was actually kind of comfortable. He had a large library and was allowed to read and write at his leisure. He wound up learning so much that he took to calling the prison the University of Arm. He even managed to write and publish a book, The Extinction of Poverty, which was almost Marxist in its treatment of the poor. The book became a surprise bestseller in France and earned Louis Napoleon a strong base of support amongst the workers. By 1846, though, Louis Napoleon had grown tired of Arm University. On May the 25th, he escaped by dressing as a laborer and simply walking out the door. He resurfaced in London a few days later and went back to his impotent coup plotting. By now, the self-proclaimed Napoleon III was almost 40 and had nothing but two failed coups to his name. It would take a spectacular turnaround for Louis Napoleon to fulfill his mother's dreams and become emperor. The entire social order of France would have to be exploded like a volcano had just erupted underneath it. Little did anyone realize that, as the 1840s drew to a close, a volcano was exactly what France was sitting on. Remember how back in 1830 the July monarchy came to power in France on the back of a revolution? Well, in 1848 it exited in exactly the same way. On February the 22nd, 1848, a governmental ban on people meeting for banquets somehow span off into violent street protests. This in turn somehow led to King Louis Philippe abdicating, the monarchy being abolished, and the Second French Republic being declared. That happens on February the 26th. This was the moment Louis Napoleon had been dreaming of. Not two days later, on February the 28th, he arrived in Paris and offered the revolutionary provincial government his help. And recurring theme here, the provisional government sent him promptly back into exile. 
Yeah, France might have revolted, but it was not a revolt aimed at putting a Bonaparte back into power. The new Republican government they wanted liberal reform, not some bumbling clown pretending to be his famous uncle. But Louis Napoleon wasn't as stupid as his enemies thought. Back in England, he settled down to watch events unfold, just biding his time. And he didn't have to bide his time for very long. On June 23, 1848, the workers of Paris revolted against the provisional government who felt that they had betrayed the revolution. The result was the June Days, a three-day massacre which saw 1,500 Parisians being killed. When it was over, the Second Republic it still stood, but those connected to it were now even less popular than the July monarchy had been. Now all of this it put Louis Napoleon in an excellent position. On September the 17th to the 18th, 1848, France held elections for the Constituent Assembly. Louis Napoleon got on the ticket and won five departments. And with that, the assembly was forced to lift his exile. Now legally back in France, Louis Napoleon began campaigning energetically for the upcoming presidential elections. He ran as an outsider populist, promising extinction of pauperism to the poor, military discipline to the Bonapartists, and a president untainted by the June days to everyone else. The results on December 10, 1848, were a landslide. Louis Napoleon robbed home with 74% of the vote. The elites, they were left gasping in his dust. This clown? was now president. Still, his opponents comforted themselves with the knowledge that the new constitution only allowed presidents one four-year term. By 1842, President Louis Napoleon, he'd be gone. I mean, after all, it's not like he had a habit of launching coups or anything like that, right? Louis Napoleon's motivations, though, they revealed themselves slowly. The self-starred prince president at first worked with the National Assembly, supporting populist moves like sending the military to Rome to protect the Pope from revolutionaries. In fact, things went so slowly that nobody even seemed to notice the way that Louis Napoleon was stuffing all the key posts in governments and the army with loyalists, kind of just like someone plotting a coup might do. In 1851, Louis Napoleon finally came into the open with his ambitions. He asked the National Assembly to amend the constitution to let him run again. They said no, so the prince president, well, he got rid of them. December the 2nd is a special day for Bonapartists. It's the day that Napoleon was coronated in 1804. It's also the day that he defeated the Third Coalition at the Battle of Austerlitz. In 1851, it also became the day that Louis Napoleon finally did a coup right. Overnight, 30,000 army loyalists occupied Paris. People awoke to posters announcing the National Assembly had been dissolved. Although some diehard Republicans manned the barricades, it simply wasn't enough. On December 4, 1851, Paris fell. President Bonaparte announced the effective dissolution of the Second Republic, then held a referendum just to check that this was cool with everyone. And it totally was, he won with an enormous margin. Ten months later, in November of 1852, he held another referendum on restoring the French Empire and giving himself near unlimited power. And yes, he won that too. On December 2nd, 1852, the first anniversary of his coup, Louis Napoleon was officially crowned Napoleon III, Emperor of the Second French Empire. This is what the famous Karl Marx quote about history repeating itself actually refers to, first as tragedy, then as farce. But what did Louis Napoleon care? He'd finally done it. He'd achieved the impossible dream that his mother had set for him back when they were both living as exiles. The world had laughed at him. And it won. Now it was time to show them just how wrong they were. What does a guy who's been lusting for power for basically his entire life do when he finally gets it? In the case of Napoleon III, the answer is, well, everything but once. The period of 1852 to 1860 is known as the Authoritarian Empire, and it's the period where Napoleon III ruled like a mad cross between a total despot, a liberal utopian, and a kid on a sugar rush running around trying to do a bazillion things at once. His biggest project was Paris. At the time, the City of Lights was actually more like the City of Horrible Smells and oh my god, what's that floating in the Seine? Ah! The French capital was filthy. Cholera outbreaks were common, the streets were crowded slums. Everything you probably picture as Paris in your mind today is exactly what the city was not in 1852. One of Emperor Napoleon III's first acts was to call architect Baron Haussmann into his office and tell him to go forth and bring in air, light, and cleanliness. Together, the two men, they wrote the Paris street plan of today. They knocked down slums, built parks, improved sanitation, gave every worker a home, created the sweeping boulevards that Paris is famous for. Those elegant buildings that pop into your head whenever you hear Paris, well, this is when they first appear. It's also when Paris first gets its nickname. Haussmann installed so many gas streetlights that the capital was christened the City of Lights. 
Still, Napoleon III's reign, it wasn't just construction work. He made education free and compulsory. He lifted the ban on women gaining higher education. He instituted public pensions and ushered in agricultural reforms that wiped out famines in France permanently. He also made the state invest heavily in railway and steamship building and opened lines of guaranteed credit to small business owners. It was almost like a new deal of the 1850s, or maybe an old new deal. And it totally worked. By 1870, the economy was growing at 5% a year, while in industrial output had boomed by 75%. In short, the clown turned out to not really be a clown at all. Napoleon III even managed to grab France and choice colonies like New Caledonia, acquired in 1853, Vietnam, 1858, and Cambodia, 1863. Now, we certainly shouldn't gloss over his authoritarian side. While France boomed economically, socially it transformed into a police state. There was censorship, restrictions on association and free speech, and there were spies everywhere. And then there was the rather sticky topic of war. The period from the end of the Napoleonic Wars until the rise of the Second French Empire it hadn't seen a single conflict between Europe's great powers. Barely was Napoleon III's throne warm from his imperial backside than the Crimean War erupted in 1853. Now, the Crimean War is super complicated, and it would be unfair to blame it all on Napoleon III, but he was itching for a fight, and he pressed forward where maybe others would have backed down. The result was a conflict that killed nearly a million people, but left France and her ally Britain newly victorious on the European stage. This confidence boost led in turn to Napoleon III getting involved with Italy's Second War of Unification in 1859. Given Italian nationalists had tried to assassinate him the year before, throwing a bomb at his carriage that killed 14 of his entourage, you might have expected Napoleon III to fight against unification, but no. He sent the French army to help the Kingdom of Sardinia kick the Austrians out of their Italian colonies. They won that war too, which is why Nice and Savoy are currently part of France. By 1860, Louis Napoleon was riding high, as Napoleon III he had really made France great again. He had also convinced himself that he was a tactical military genius on par with his legendary uncle. He had even found time to marry Countess Eugenie de Montier. But you know what they say about pride? It always comes before a fall, and to Louis Napoleon, he was a legendary fool. Historians of the Second French Empire call the period after 1860 the Liberal Empire. Why? Well, it's the period when Napoleon III pivoted from being a nasty despot to a slightly more cuddly one. The transformation came in 1860. To head off a political crisis over the huge loans his projects were racking up, Louis Napoleon offered his Senate new powers and eased censorship. The changes were enough to keep him in power and led to more liberalization down the line. Yet all this is really just a sideshow to the two major events of 1862. The first was something of a private problem. Louis Napoleon's reign had been partially held together by his boundless energy, but in 1862 he developed exceedingly painful bladder stones that sapped his energy and left him reliant on those around him. The second was far more consequential for world history, and that was the rise of Otto von Bismarck. We've actually got another biographics video in the works about Bismarck, so we're not going to get too sidetracked with him right here, but just let me give you a very quick overview. Bismarck was the minister-president of Prussia, a Germanic country roughly analogous to modern eastern Germany and northern Poland, with its capital in Berlin. Bismarck was a firm believer in both the strategic use of warfare and the unification of all the many German statelets into a single Germany. He was also a political genius who didn't take fools lightly, which was a big problem for Louis Napoleon. Not that tiny Prussia appeared much of a threat to France in 1862. When Bismarck went to war against the Danes in 1864, Napoleon III barely even noticed. In October of 1865, Louis Napoleon even promised the Iron Chancellor that France wouldn't intervene if Prussia went to war with Austria. Less than a year later, the Seven Weeks' War ended with Vienna beaten. Louis Napoleon actually mediated the peace talks, which oversaw the creation of a sort of half-unified Germany, the Northern German Confederation. This was a problem, because it was now clear that this thing called Germany was becoming extremely big and extremely powerful in a very short space of time. But Napoleon III, he was simply too arrogant, or maybe too deluded, to realize the threat that Germany posed. He still thought that he was the senior partner in the relationship with Bismarck. It wasn't until Bismarck blocked the French annexation of Luxembourg by threatening war that Louis Napoleon realized that 
he was in over his head. The big trouble was that everyone else realized it too. When France backed off on Luxembourg, Bismarck was able to see just how weak the French Empire was. The French public, they turned on their emperor. In the 1869 elections, the government nearly lost control of the Senate. By the end of 1869, Napoleon III was forced to fully liberalize the empire just to keep power, turning it into a kind of constitutional monarchy. Now, unfortunately, the change meant listening more than ever to what the public wanted. And what the public wanted was war with Prussia. Even by the standards of the 19th century, the causes of the Franco-Prussian War are ridiculous beyond belief. In Spain, Queen Isabella abdicated the throne and a Prussian prince offered to take her place. France said no and sent their ambassador to tell the Prussian king to back off. The ambassador met the king on a walk, shouted at him for a minute, and then stormed off. And with that begins the Franco-Prussian War. All right, so it was slightly more complicated than that in reality. The real trigger was the Ems Dispatch, which contained an account of the meeting between the king and the ambassador that was perfectly calibrated to make both sides think that they'd been grievously insulted. It was edited by Bismarck, who by now had decided a quick war with the French would be the perfect bonding exercise to seal German unification. And he got his wish. On July the 19th, 1870, France declared war on Prussia. The French army's 280,000 troops, they were mobilized. Despite being being shockingly ill by this stage, Napoleon III rode out to personally lead the troops. Amusingly, his staff were so sure that they'd soon be conquering German territory that they forgot to pack any maps of their own country. The first engagement it came on August the 4th, 1870, and it was a massacre. The well-trained Prussians made mincemeat out of Louis Napoleon's shambolic army for two entire days. After a staggering retreat, the French fought again on August the 16th, and again they were wiped out. Getting desperate, Louis Napoleon tried to summon the spirit of his dead uncle. He gathered all remaining French soldiers for an attack on the Prussian troops besieging Metz. This was exactly the sort of foolhardy gamble that his uncle would have made, but the difference is his uncle had have pulled it off. On the 1st of September 1870, the French and the Prussians fought the Battle of Sedan, which could just as well be called the Defeat of Sedan. The French, they were pulverized. The Prussians managed to encircle and then capture their entire army. Among those arrested was Louis Napoleon. When the news of their emperor's capture reached Paris on September the 4th, the government was so outraged that it voted then and there to abolish the Second French Empire, along with its useless emperor. France immediately became the Third Republic. It wasn't the end of the war, though. That dragged on through the grueling siege of Paris. But for Louis Napoleon, it was done. Louis Napoleon was kept prisoner until a peace treaty was signed and the unification of Germany was declared on January 18, 1871. Finally, in March, the now former emperor was released back into exile in England. But his humiliations, they were not done yet. In the wake of France's epic defeat, Paris was seized by a radical revolutionary group that became known as the Paris Commune. They ruled for two months before putting Paris to the torch when the French army retook the city. The new Paris that Louis Napoleon had spent so long building was simply burned to the ground. Although it would be ultimately rebuilt to his designs, he would never live to see it. Over in England, Louis Napoleon had settled in the village of Chislehurst with his wife and their son, who they still called the Prince Imperial. It was a short and painful retirement. Louis Napoleon's health got worse until, on January the 9th, 1873, he went to the hospital for a last-ditch operation to cure his bladder stones. He died under the knife at age 65. All of those times he'd listened to his mother as a young exile and dreamed of being emperor, he could have never imagined that it would end like this. In 1879, Louis Napoleon's heir, the Prince Imperial, also died, extinguishing their family's line. Two years later, his wife Eugenie had both of them reburied in Farnborough, a pleasantly boring town some 30 miles from London. Although the tomb that holds Napoleon III remains a tourist attraction, it's hardly les valide. So what, in the end, did Louis Napoleon accomplish? Well, he ruled France for longer than his uncle did, and he undoubtedly oversaw an industrial boom that modernized the French economy. He founded colonies like New Caledonia that are still departments of France today, and he promoted workers and women's rights at a time when it was deeply unfashionable. On the other hand, he took France from a peaceful state back to one of dangerous warfare and paid a catastrophically high price. The peace settlements after the Franco-Prussian War crippled France all the way into World War I. But perhaps the biggest thing that the other Emperor Bonaparte accomplished was becoming the other Emperor Bonaparte. This was a man who, as a child, was banned from his home country, forced to live in exile, and derided as a clown. Yet through sheer dogged determination, he managed to conquer the very system that had locked him out, if only for a brief time.
Was he a clown? Was he a tyrant? Was he a visionary leader let down by one disastrous lapse in judgment? Well, the jury's still out on that one. But there's one thing we cannot deny Louis Napoleon. He was, and will forever be, Napoleon III, Emperor of the French. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this several times a week. So hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up, and you'll find out about all of those. If you're looking for something else to watch, though, why not check out my other channel called Top Tens? You'll find a link to that on the screen now as well as below this video. And as always, thank you for watching.